Thank you for joining us today. My name is Ed. Um, I'm part of the uh, global support for Autodesk, uh, Eagle. And with us, we also have George. Yeah, I'm George Garcia. I'm a support specialist here at Autodesk Eagle as well, along with my colleague Ed. And thanks for joining us today on this uh, Pro Perspective webinar. Uh, title it, I'm done with my design, what now? Uh, kind of excited uh, sitting down and talking with an experienced industry manufacturer pro. Mr. Dwayne Benson is joining us uh, from Screaming Circuits. Uh, he'll be walking us through the best steps um, to take um, for manufacturing. What are the best practices um, that should be used during your design? Um, hey, Dwayne, thanks for joining us. Um, and thanks for taking um, uh, kind of like uh, we'll talk a little bit about what's going on. So thanks for joining us. Great to be here. Um, you're very welcome. I'm glad to be here as as well. Um, I've been with uh, Screaming Circuits for a little over 10 years now and in, in the electronics design world uh, quite a bit longer than that. Uh, nice thing about this particular uh, uh, position that I'm in is that we end up learning an awful lot about what happens with uh, you know what kind of uh, challenges people have in getting their boards manufactured and we like to package those up and pass them on as much as possible to help uh, everybody else see what kind of what things trip people up when they're getting their boards manufactured awesome awesome so uh, we're gonna go ahead and officially uh, we set up the room for Dwayne now. If anybody has any questions uh, throughout the presentation, just go ahead and use the, the chat group um, to post any um, specific questions. Uh, Jorge and myself will be manning the chat, so we'll do our best to uh, respond to them um, in a timely manner. And uh, we will, if it's necessary, we will go ahead and interrupt uh, Dwayne. Dwayne, at the end of the webinar, please don't exit your screens just in case there's any questions that we want to go directly to your screen and you could demonstrate it. Um, so with no further ado, Dwayne, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you and uh, welcome everybody. As I mentioned, uh, as I mentioned here, I'm uh, from Screaming Circuits and uh, um, you may have, if you've been to the Embedded Systems Conferences, you may have seen me speak there. I do a little bit of writing here and there. Um, so I've been with the industry for quite a while and am uh, happy to pass on this information. What we find is we see similar traps uh, um, repeating themselves in uh, quite a few jobs that we get. So I'm going to walk through a couple of those and how to avoid them. First of all, <clears throat> Excuse me. First of all, a couple of definitions. Um, the Gerber files. That's that's what you. Uh, that's how your CAD system is represented to the board manufacturers and the assembly houses. It uh, basically takes the layers and turns them into bitmaps that are then used to uh, that are then turned into pot copper and used to place your parts. Included there, the important ones are the drill files, um, the copper layers. Obviously, you have to have those. Um, if you have been hand soldering and are moving to machine soldering, then the solder mask layer becomes important, as does the silk screen layer. And if you're using surface mount, the solder, uh, solder paste layer becomes pretty important as well. Now over on the uh, eagle screen on the left here, we're going to go through, and in the upper left you see the dialog for layers. We're going to be using that today and I'm going to be talking a little bit about the stop layer and the cream layer. Um, Eagle calls it cream. It's also known as the solder paste layer or the stencil layer. First problem we run across, one of the most problem, one of the most common problems we see is uh, what we call via in pad. <clears throat> Essentially, that means if you've got a real if you've got real tight spacing, you need to put your vias someplace to get your uh, your routing to the other side of the board. It's pretty common for people to throw those into the BGA pads, and uh, that's a really bad thing to do. If you've got the open via like that over here on the presentation screen, you can see two representations of them. Uh, the uh, solder is going to wick down in the hole and you'll lose the solder ball, you'll get solder on the bottom side of the screen, and you essentially won't have a mechanical or an electrical connection. 
Generally, with larger B BGAs, we'll see the uh, the vias in between the pads, so in the little uh, diagonal boxes. And generally, that's okay as long as you can have solder mask covering the uh, the the trace between the pad and the via. Over on the right on the PowerPoint screen here, you can see a case where there's the BGA pad and a clear open copper path to the via. Well, that works very similar to having just a plain open via in the pad. It'll uh, The solder will wick down and you'll lose your mechanical and electrical connection. I'm going to go over here to the, uh, the Eagle CAD screen and show you an example of what to do about that. So here I'm zooming in on this on this uh, BGA here, and we've got the red pads and then my yellow via. So I'm going to go back over to the layer dialog, and I'm going to turn on the stop layer. Okay, the green hash mark, that tells you where there will not be solder mask. So there will not be solder mask on the pads. There will not be solder mask in this big circle around the via. And if you notice, that overlaps with the pad. So that means um, you're going to lose the uh, solder in down the via, and that's not a good thing. In order to fix that, what you want to do is, again, on the, the uh, screen, go over to the DRC check on the uh, left toolbar down at the bottom. Open that up, and then on the tab, almost farthest to the right, second from the right, is the tab masks. And we see these two numbers here stop. Right now they're set at 4 mil. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop those down to 2 mil and then apply. And you notice, go ahead and, and select that here. You notice the uh, solder mask circle got smaller on the via. Now you're still going to have to check with your board house to make sure that uh, that they can fit these geometries, uh, that their precision works, so that you don't have, so that you do have solder mask between. But in general, this is what you're going to do. If you still can't get it small enough, get the uh, the mask uh, small enough there. You'll need to go to a smaller via size. And here's an example over on the right, um, on the PowerPoint again, where you've got the pads, good solder mask between the pads and the and the vias. On the uh, PowerPoint again, over on the right, there with smaller BGAs, new micro BGAs, um, there will be times when you need to have the via in the pad. There simply isn't any choice. When that happens, you have to go to your board house and tell them that you need the vias filled and plated over with copper. Not all board houses can do that, and it's a little more expensive, but with a micro via, it's, it's your only option. <clears throat> the next most uh, frequent problem we see relates to QFN packages. You see a lot of the newer power components, um, smaller microcontrollers, um, audio components in these little tiny QFN packages. Many of them, not all, but many of them have a heat slug on the bottom or a grounding slug on the bottom. So you'll see, if you turn it over, you'll see the, the pads and a big uh, open metal area. On the uh, PowerPoint here on the right, you can see this is a stencil opening for a typical QFN. Well, what happens, is because the uh, the pins are so small, you've got a high ratio of, of uh, stencil thickness to pad size. Out here, you've got a very low ratio of stencil thickness to pad size. And then what happens is you end up with much more solder in the middle, and the QFN literally floats up. You'll see uh, either no connections, or it'll be tipped at an angle, and you'll get half the connections. So that causes a lot of reliability problems with QFNs. And the way to solve that problem <clears throat> is to segment your stencil, like, again, we have over on the right. So you want to segment that and get about 50%, maybe 75% um, uh, co or, uh, solder paste coverage on the, uh, on the QFN. So I'm going to show you that over here again on the, on the Eagle screen. 
here's an example of a QFN. So what I'm going to have to do is modify the library component. First of all, I'll go on the left toolbar on Eagle to get the info button, click on the pad, and it tells me what library I've got. So I've got to go find that library and what package. Up on the menu bar on top, go to library, open, and find that particular one. Right here, this library only has the one part. I got it from Snap EDA. Now, you can see the library component with the silk screen layer on. So, if it's not, if you don't see the silk screen come down, or the uh, solder pa paste come down here, it has its own separate uh, dialog for layers, so make sure the cream layer is, is covered. Now what I'm going to do is info within the, uh, the uh, library editing screen, click on the part, <coughs> And over here, this little dialog that pops up, you see down there, lower left, thermals, stop, and cream. So remove that. So now there's no solder paste uh, on this particular uh, component. And what I'm going to have to do, first I need to adjust my grid small enough so that I can do some work on it. And I'm going to take a rectangle here, make sure up here in the layer the layer pull down that I select the the layer cream top cream and I'm creating my own solder paste layer so you want to create a grid like this again you're going to want to shoot for 50 to 75 percent coverage and that'll give you just about the right amount of solder so that everything um, uh, comes together well and I will save this now I'm, gonna, now I'm gonna flip back to the main CAD screen go to my layers here I don't need the stop or the stop layer so I'll turn that off I'll look at the cream layer now what I have to do you can see the full open uh, solder paste layer I'm gonna go update that library and now you can see I've got a nice, uh, uh, nice segmented uh, opening in the stencil there, which is uh, will lead to good manufacturing. And this works. This is important whether you're sending it away to a commercial manufacturer or uh, using a toaster oven at home. I do that myself sometimes for some of uh, my uh, hobby projects. Um, doesn't matter where you're getting it, it done, it's important to do this uh, if you want a good uh, QFN yield. There are uh, other components that uh, have big open solder slug or heat slugs in the middle. Um, you can do this with those as well. Here on the right, I've got some uh, a couple of MOSFETs, surface mount MOSFET, MOSFETs, a couple of surface mount uh, power di uh, diodes. So it's not just the QFNs. <coughs> Following that, uh, what we see an awful lot of are uh, footprint and uh, footprint differences and PCB marking issues. Footprint issues, for example, if we go over to the PowerPoint here on the right, <coughs> excuse me, we've got an example of a uh, probably a MOSFET or maybe a regulator that almost fits the land pattern, but not quite the. Uh, the copper area for the heat slug was a little bit higher for whatever part this whatever component this land pattern was originally designed for and what happened is the surface tension of the solder pulled the uh, the part up and we almost don't have any connections here <coughs> this other one on the uh, on the right on the powerpoint we have a little diode here that has a bigger pad on one side than the other and the designer here used just a common um, common uh, diode pad. And what happened is the uh, surface tension pulled that larger heat slug area over. And you can barely see the little cutout here. So that diode was hanging out. Um, this is a modified pad over here. Bottom line is go to the data sheet. Um, if you're using a land pattern that isn't specifically designed for your component, 
um, go to the data sheet, look at the numbers, uh, make sure it matches exactly to prevent problems like this. <clears throat> Capacitors and diodes cause us a lot cause a lot of problems too. If you notice on capacitors, for example, a metal can capacitor on the right, <clears throat> the black area on the right, dark area on the right indicates negative. On a tantalum capacitor, the black area on the left <clears throat> indicates positive. So you want to make sure that you uh, clearly mark your your uh, your components. <clears throat> With a capacitor, you always want to use a plus sign. A minus sign can be interpreted for a number of other things. Diodes are also uh, particularly problematic. Um, the markings on the diodes vary a lot uh, from manufacturer to manufacturer, and that can lead to a lot of ambiguity. <clears throat> when you've got a diode, a lot of people think they can just mark uh, a plus for the uh, cathode, or uh, or a, a line for the solid line for the cathode, because that's where the line is on the diode. Problem is, is that you really don't know if that's plus or minus. Excuse me, and plus for the anode would be standard. Um, you really don't know where, whether that's plus or minus unless you know the circuit, and that can be a problem for the manufacturer. If it's a barrier diode or a flyback diode. Um, then in fact the positive would be on the cathode side and if you're looking at a plus or a minus <clears throat> the manufacturer might misinterpret that and put your diodes on backwards. <clears throat> LEDs are especially notorious for that. Uh, I've seen some uh, surface mount LEDs where on the particular component the exact same marking in some cases is the anode and in some cases is the cathode so it, it can be crazy. The data sheet is your friend and especially with LEDs the exact part number every single character digit in that part number is significant. With capacitors a plus is always the best way to mark them remove the ambiguity um, the minus side as I said can be interpreted for a number of different a number of different things. We also see a lot of thermal issues, especially with the, with the smaller components, and these are things that uh, are completely new to, uh, to assembly if you're coming from uh, through-hole parts. These sorts of problems don't occur, but we see them a lot on smaller passive parts. Over on the right here on the PowerPoint, <clears throat> one of the uh, common issues is what we call tombstoning. What happens is the solder paste on one side of the component melts before the solder paste on the other side, and the uh, the side that melts, the surface tension will literally pull the component up to a standing straight up position. Looks like a tombstone. That's why they call it tombstoning. Some things that people don't always think about uh, in this illustration here on the PowerPoint um, underneath the label tombstoning. This is representing a big component. It might be a, a big diode or a 1206 size capacitor, uh, like a tantalum capacitor. And then right next to it, we've got a little tiny component, which might be an 0201 or 0402 resistor, for example. And the two are uh, in line here. Well, what happens is the big component acts like a heat sink, and it slows the solder paste melting on the pad that's closest to it from that little component, uh, sucks the heat away from it. So the other pad melts first, the thing can pop up, and then you will lose your connection, have a bad design, or have an unworking uh, board. So the solution to this is to take that small component, flip it 90 degrees so it's perpendicular to the large component, then the heat sink is operating in both pads equally. Another issue we see sometimes, um, this can seem like a complete mystery because the design looks great, everything else, but what we have found is sometimes we'll get boards with the solder mask too thick. That's the A and B illustration. You don't want the solder mask to be any thicker than the copper. Over on the B side here, <clears throat> that represents uh, um, what happens, and the part will actually rest on the solder, uh, the silk screen, and may not touch the solder paste at all or may connect on one side better than the other and then you can get tombstoning or simply a, 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 a poor mechanical connection. 
some other things that uh, are important to uh, to consider with the small parts um, on the PowerPoint again if you look on the lower left you see an example of a passive component with a small trace going out on one side and a large trace going out on, on the other. Um, we see this a fair amount if, say, this were a capacitor, and on the right here, this is a power rail. The power rail is normally thick, thick, so the designer just keeps the same size trace going down to it. Well, as in before, the thick trace acts like a heat sink. This pad will melt um, after the other pad, and you can have a poor mechanical connection, tombstoning, um, little gap, something like that. On the example on the right here, it's not just the copper on the surface. Think of the yellow here as an internal copper layer. So in this example, you've got, say, a ground plane or a power plane inside the board underneath one half of the pad or one half of the part. Again, this pad is going to melt a little bit slower. This one will melt faster, and you can end up with tombstoning or a, uh, or a poor connection on the right side. So be sensitive to... Um, cases like this, if, uh, if you've got a, uh, a, a plane inside the board, make sure your component is, is either completely covered by or completely over the, the, the plane or completely outside of the plane area. Another problem we have uh, along the same lines, uh, if you've got large surface mount components close together, um, this example is um, a couple of, uh, or a number of uh, uh, capacitors, and these are Rojas compatible compa capacitors, so in theory they can stand the heat, but what happens is because they're so close together here, the thermal mass of the two capacitors, again, prevent the solder in the middle or slow the solder melt in the middle. So in order to get both sides of that to melt, these parts aren't going to tombstone, but we had to keep it in the oven a little bit longer, and the capacitor bulged here, which means it's destroyed. With the capacitor so close together, you can't stick a soldering iron in there and, uh, and touch them up. Back on the left on the, uh, on the Eagle CAD screen, here's an example. This is very similar to what that was. And the reason you might have multiple capacitors like this is um, for motor drivers or power supplies, you want a very low ESR effective uh, series resistance, so you'll put a lot of cap capacitors in parallel. Now in this particular case, we'd have a problem between the capacitors, so what we do is we go over toolbar on the left, click the group icon, and we can either move these farther apart if you've got the board real estate, so you've got good airflow between the two, or room to touch up with a soldering iron, or move them all in series like this. Um, if you, you know, if you don't have the room to do this in your design, uh, you're either going to have to you're going to have to do something different and make sure that you can get a good solder uh, solder connection on all of these sides here. You know, there are a lot of things that we can physically do, but electrically they simply don't work. And with manufacturing, it's the same way. There there are things that you can do with to a board layout that simply are not manufacturer manufacturable. So you, you and you do need to consider those as you're designing your boards, putting together your layout. <clears throat> Another problem we run across relates to, uh, to panels. If you've got uh, a large number of boards or if they're super small boards, um, it's a good idea to have them built in a panel as opposed to individually. It, it uh, goes through the surface mount machines quicker and easier, a lot more reliable than you know if you've got 100 really small boards. Uh, some people are tempted to panelize themselves within the CAD system. Uh, it's best not to do that. What you want is to tell your board house to panelize them. They have software to do that. They'll give you the uh, the most optimum panelization, and uh, then they can pass that data on to the uh, assembly company. A couple of things to work to uh, watch for, though. Um, some connectors, some parts overhang the side of the board. Like this is a USB connector here. And as you can see on the PowerPoint on the right, it has these little tabs that hang over. Um, that can be a problem when you've panelized your board. Here's an example. Um, 
the component, uh, you don't want it to sit on a panel rail like this. So when you tell your board house to panelize, if you have overhanging components, you need to be specific about where not to put those. So for example, on the document layer, on the document layer in your, um, in your CAD file, let's go over here. I'm going to put some text in on the left, the toolbar T for text. And I'm going to type So something like this, make it very clear, and then I want to select the layer. This is T51 docu, and I'm going to put that right here by this overhanging connector so they don't put a panel tab there. And you'll want to make sure your uh, your board fab house looks at the document layer. Uh, you know, the industry has a lot of standards. Unfortunately, not everybody follows them. So it's when in doubt, it's always best to, to give some special instructions to your, uh, to your manufacturer, your board house, or your assembly house to make sure there's no ambiguity. Uh, make sure you're getting the exact design that you want. <clears throat> Another thing that's, that can help when, you've, uh, when you're panelizing your boards is what we call fiducials. And what a fiducial is, is it's simply a little dot, um, a clearly identifiable dot in a pattern around either the individual board or the panel that makes sure there's only one way to align the board and that the uh, surface mount machines have something to, to line up on. You don't always need it. For example, at Screaming Circuits here, we can manufacture boards without the fiducials, but they're still a good idea and a lot of manufacturers do require them. And you'll notice here are the two different patterns I've got. Um, they can't, they're not reversible. And that's the important thing because you want to make sure that the machine knows where the board's it, board is and it's not flipped 180 degrees. A fiducial is simply a small one to two millimeter copper pad with no uh, solder mask on it. And you'll want to have a solder mask opening around it um, two to five millimeters in diameter. Um, so you get nice high contrast there on the, uh, on the fiducial, so there's no ambiguity. Um, some large components also, the individual components will have fiducials. In high volume manufacturing, they use that to, um, to help uh, with the alignment of the uh, large, uh, especially high density pin components. So to, to summarize that, summarize the presentation, most important thing is no open vias and pads. Uh, it simply is not a manufacturable, manufacturable board if you've got open vias in the pads. It can lead to poor electrical connections on the top and solder spread out on the bottom. Um, it's a bad scene all around. Segment your QFN stencils. QFNs are more and more common these days, and um, they're still um, difficult to manufacture if the stencil isn't done right. Uh, I can remember uh, when QFNs were still fairly rare, we'd get some designs where we'd get like 10% yield with an open, open uh, paste area in the center pad. Once we started segmenting the, stenc the stencils in that center pad, we'd go up to more standard, you know, 100 or 99 and a half percent yield. So it can make a significant difference there. It's really important to follow that. Verify the footprints. Verify every footprint if you're unsure about it. Even through hole components, long through hole connectors. We've seen a number of cases where um, you have uh, a component that has 0.1 inch spacing between the pins. Well, that's 2.54 uh, millimeters, um, you see footprints that are 2.5 millimeters with a small number of pins, it's not going to matter. But if you've got like a 50 pin through hole connector, it's going to matter. Same thing with surface mount, we see some of those. So make sure you're using the same uh, units of measurement on your footprints. Make sure the copper areas are exactly where the data sheet says they're supposed to be. And then double check your polarities. Um, yeah, don't leave anything up for assumptions. The manufacturers don't know what's in your head. 
Uh, so be very, very clear on anode, cathode for uh, for all diodes, um, pinouts for uh, for uh, multi-diode packages like a like a tricolor LED. Sometimes they have odd pin numbers, and for your capacitors as well. And as uh, Ed mentioned, uh, if you do at some point want to uh, try out some uh, uh, manufacturing from screaming circuits, write down this code here, SC-Eagle17. Uh, give that to the person you speak to or enter it in the website and special instructions, and I'll give you 10% off the, the assembly labor for your, uh, for your board design or your board assembly. And I want to thank you for being here and uh, open it up for questions. So thanks, Dwayne, for that excellent presentation. We do have one question right now um, from David. He's asking, do you have any comments on the effects of using multiple drill sizes in a design? Okay. The, uh, the primary effect that of that relates to the board fabrication house. Um, a lot of fab houses have uh, lower prices on, uh, on, uh, on small quantities of boards, but they may have a limited uh, number of drills that they offer. So they may say, hey, for our low-cost boards, you can only use uh, these 10 drill sizes, for example. Um, and if you've got a number of, uh, if you've got more drill sizes or drill sizes that don't match what they're offering, then typically what they'll do is uh, use the next next smallest drill size. Um, some places I've seen use the next larger drill size. So um, you know if if they use the next largest, then you can end up causing spacing issues, eat into a a, a close by trace or something like that. Um, so if you do have a lot of drill sizes, um, all the fab many all the fab houses will tell you what drill sizes are available on what pricing scheme. So double check. Um, you want to get yours as close to what they have as possible. And then uh, if uh, you've got an odd drill size, just make sure that pin or that via is not close enough to anything else that it might end up uh, um, bumping into if they use a larger drill. OK, excellent. Thanks, Dwayne. Um, let me see, because David is again typing. So let's see what he comes back with. If there's any other questions, please feel free to post them through the chat, and we'll pass them along to Dwayne. Uh, where is Screaming Circuit's list of available drill sizes, just as a reference? Well, Screaming Circuit's is the uh, assembly house, so we put the parts on the boards, and um, we will use boards from just about any uh, board house. Um, we use a lot from Sunstone, Sunstone Circuit's, and they do have the, their drill sizes listed on the reference of their website. Um, I'm not sure the exact uh, page, but it's not that difficult to uh, to find. Okay, excellent. Uh, he's typing in. Let's see. Yeah, he said he was sorry. He didn't remember. <laughs> That's quite all right. That's quite all right. Uh, using 0, 2, 0, 1 components and the effects on assembly. If you're using the small the small components on that, there are a couple of things you need to you need to watch for. Um, since those things are so small, it's uh, much easier for uh, for them to get lost in the machine. So you want to um, give extra for attrition. Uh, um, most places want you to double the number of 0201s, so if you have 100 in your entire job, send 200. Um, they don't always, that doesn't always happen, but um, it's pretty industry standard that 0201s um, are uh, a bit of a problem in that manner. The other thing you want to do is make really sure um, to uh, look at your layout for tombstoning issues. Um, back in the presentation where I talked about uh, tombstoning concerns, um, those two slides are very, very important with O201s. In general, the trace should be smaller than the pad size. Um, most important thing is to have the trace equal on both sides, though. If, if you're... Uh, 
if your O201 is uh, connected to a plane, you definitely want to have thermal release relief, absolutely, um, or move it off away from the plane and connect it up with a trace. O201s okay. are, are great. It's awesome to be able to squeeze your board size down like that, but but they do come with a little bit of extra risk. Excellent, Dwayne. So far, it looks like that's it for the oh, oh yeah, that's it for the questions. Very well. So I'm going to go ahead and kick it back to uh, to Ed. Yeah, you know, I wanted to just make a comment. Uh, Eagle uh, has a feature called User Language Program. And um, you could uh, yeah, the ULPs actually extend um, the use uh, of Eagle to uh, be able to uh, customize it to either export, import, or yes, create some sort of effects on your command. So Eagle actually has a ULP um, by Screaming Circuits. It actually comes with uh, when you install Eagle. It's a uh, it's a ULP that was created to. Cr um, to generate centroid data. So it's called Screaming Circuit Centroid Data. The way you run it is by clicking on the ULP icon up on the top toolbar and select the Screaming Circuit's uh, ULP. And that will generate um, a ASCII file for your centroid data for uh, for your placement. So I just wanted to make that comment. That was a contribution done by, um, by Screaming Circuit's quite a bit ago. So it's available there as well. Um, I don't see any other questions, any further comments. Um, great, greatly appreciate Dwayne, uh, your attendance for being here, doing this presentation for us. Um, great information. You're very welcome. We're hoping to, to do a continuation to this uh, sometime next month uh, since it's a, it's a topic that uh, no matter how big or how small manufacturer prototype, it's a really good topic to be uh, covering. Uh, we'll be posting the, the, our next webinar really soon, so uh, we'll be sending that uh, through via your emails. Um, and there's the promo code that we had promised. If you're able to stick with us until the end of the webinar, um, that's the promo code to go ahead and use. Uh, thank you very much, Dwayne. It was a pleasure. Jorge, thanks for helping us out with this. Anybody in attendance, we um, this has been recorded and will be available um, to the public uh, within the next few days, and we'll send everybody a notification when it's ready, okay? Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks. Bye now.